Alter Your Health podcast, your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. Today's guest is Dr. Christy Fleetwood. Dr. Fleetwood earned a Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy from the Medical College of Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University in 1988. After practicing as a retail pharmacist in the greater Richmond area for a decade and being failed by conventional medicine in her own health crisis, she attended Bastyr University where she earned a doctorate in naturopathic medicine in 2004. Because her unique education and training, she calls herself medically bilingual, understanding both conventional medicine as well as natural healing forms. And because she is so frequently asked to teach on pharmacology and pharmacy related topics, she studies them constantly, going deeper into the intricacies and nuances of the agents and uncovering some astonishing information that she thinks the public at large would benefit from knowing. And that is exactly why Dr. Christy Fleetwood is on the Alter Your Health podcast here today. She is going to be sharing her wisdom, her knowledge, and her experience in the realms of pharmaceutical medicines, as well as natural healing, of course. And we will be talking about the pharmaceutical industry and why humans uh, have become so dependent on so many pharmaceutical medicines. We're also gonna be talking about some of the alternative effects that a lot of these drugs have, AKA side effects, which are actually just like any of the other effects, the desired effects or side effects, they're all effects, right? So we're gonna be talking about some of those and how um, over the, you know, in chronic use of a lot of pharmaceutical medications can be detrimental when it comes to uh, health and healing naturally. And finally, we're going to get to the most important part of the interview, which is why I wanted to do- talk with Dr. Fleetwood today. And that's um, some advice and recommendations, generally speaking, for people who are wanting to get off of their medications and heal naturally. So we're gonna go over some really basic basic foundational components when it comes to um, de-prescribing, unprescribing uh, medications. Um, and just a reminder for all of you listeners, regardless of where you're tuning in from, if you would be so kind as to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast, as well as share it with anyone who you feel would be um, who would benefit from the information that's shared. So without further ado, here we go with Dr. Christy Fleetwood. Okay, and welcome to another episode of Alter Your Health. I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Christy Fleetwood with us today. She, um, she has a background in pharmacy with a PH pharmacy, pharmaceutical pharmacy stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and she has, you know, in, in her more recent life, and I'll let her get into it, come into more of a maybe pharmacy with an F as a naturopathic doctor. So mm-hmm. welcome to the podcast, Dr. Christy Fleetwood. Thank you, Dr. Alter. And I, <laughs> I love the name of this podcast, Alter <laughs> Your Life. I think that's fantastic. Alter your health and life. Alter your health. Well, which will alter your life. Our health is our life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about your background as a pharmacist and then how that kind of opened up into your profession now as a naturopathic doctor. Right. So my, um, my story, huh? Um, right. I went to pharmacy school mostly because when I was a junior in high school, I took a test that said I was well suited for the healing arts. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I've never never considered that. I really wanted to, I don't remember if I wanted to major in music and minor in theater or the other way around, but I was going to be a performer. Um, I know that's a shock to you having taught some of your classes. Um, But my mom, I'm from the South, from the Southeast, and my mom said, Chris Fay, your girl, you're going to have to work twice as hard to make half as much money as any man. 
So you need to get a job that where you can support yourself and you will be independent of any man. Um, and you can do your fun stuff. You can do your theater and your artsy thing on the side. So the test that I took that the guidance counselor gave me said healing arts. And I thought about being a doctor. No, that was not appealing because, you know, sick people hang out with doctors. <laughs> um, nurses. No, oh, no, no. Um, bedpans and puke and that sort of thing. Not at all appealing. Um, plus their hats. Eh. <laughs> right. Dentistry. No, no, not a fan of dentistry. So that left pharmacy. And I thought, yeah, pharmacy. I'll be able to mix things. And I loved chemistry and I was pretty good in math. So I decided to pursue pharmacy, having never been inside a pharmacy, didn't know any pharmacists, but I did the fast track through pharmacy school. That was way back in the day, 30 years ago this year, 30 Whoa. years yeah. Right. So um, that was so far back that we didn't give doctorates in pharmacy. I, got, I, I hold a bachelor of science degree specific for pharmacy. So I'm an RPH, registered pharmacist, and my, I keep my pharmacy license current, even though I have not practiced behind a pharmacy counter. I've not worn the white coat and poured pills for almost 17 years. My last job behind a pharmacy counter was when I was pregnant with my younger son and I was so huge that I couldn't reach the counter. <laughs> I had to turn my belly sideways so that I could get close enough to the counter. So. I was done. By that point, though, I had undergone a pretty serious transformation in my own healing journey. I'd had numerous emotional traumas. Um, they were not physical traumas. I did not get physically hurt, but I went through a number of emotional jolts with the death of a child and the denial and removal of his father, my first husband, um, my elder, older brother kind of divorced himself from the entire family and cut his part, his family off of the larger family. My parents moved. Um, I left my job, I sold the house, I moved to a different area of the state. And frankly, I was, as one might imagine, depressed and suicidal. Um, and no one could help. And because there was so much emotional pain and because I was trying to maintain that social facade that we are taught to do, um, I made everything look as normal as possible because I was still in the pharmacy. I was still dealing with the public. I was still <laughs> trying to make my way through the day. And so I suppressed all of those painful things that were occurring in and around me. Um, I just kind of stuffed them down. And literally, I stuffed them into my reproductive organs and would swell and have huge pain bouts, doubling over in pain um, at the pharmacy counter. Uh, I actually fell off of my bicycle. I was bicycling with a friend and was struck by such pain could on the bike and I ended up pedal. I was paralyzed from the pain and I fell over. Hmm. Um, some crazy stuff. And I went to doctors, no one could help me. No one could find anything wrong with my, with any of my reproductive organs. I was begging for a hysterectomy at age 26. Um, 
And I remember finally having exploratory lapros laparoscopy. The doctor finally agreed to go in, open me up, and make sure that I didn't have a knife <laughs> poking in my belly somewhere. And I remember being woken up in recovery room and, and the doctor looking at me saying, Christy, everything inside you physically is pristine. You need to find a good counselor. And then I went unconscious again. Okay, so I did some counseling. And then I got sick. I had all these swollen nodes and the nodes wouldn't go down and I couldn't even turn my head to like check the rear view mirror. I couldn't, I couldn't, they were that swollen. We're talking, did I have a lymphoma kind of swollen? Mm -hmm. So I had several rounds of antibiotics, nothing shifted. I got referred to a hematologist oncologist, but I, the only one that I would consider going to at that point in time had an eight month wait list. I thought, well, you know, if I've got lymphoma, I'll probably be dead by the time I get to his office. So I decided to hike and bike the Grand Canyon. <laughs> um, and while I was getting prepared for that, I was on a 47 mile bike ride bicycling. Um, and this time I didn't double over in pain and fall off my bike, but rather at mile 46 on a road that I have ridden for years. It was a hot, sweaty day in central Virginia, and I was taking off my biking gloves, and the world tilted, and I wrecked again on my bike, but this time enough to break a rib and scrape a bunch of body parts up and um, mess up my bike enough that I ended up limping the last mile to my destination. <laughs> Got taken to the ER, of course, um, broken bones, gravel under the skin. <clears throat> but I ended up going to a chiropractor because the bone was the second rib, a green stick fracture, and there was really nothing that conventional medicine could offer me. So I saw my chiropractor who had kept me from surgery about three times by that point, And he's the one who said, Christy, you need to quit your job, go on vacation for at least three weeks, three months would be better. And I mean a vacation where you just lie around and somebody else takes care of you. Not, because I know you, Christy, you're going to want to do something like, I don't know, bike and hike in the Grand Canyon. I swear I hadn't told him. <laughs> <laughs> but he sent me home with his juicer and strict instructions to drink only distilled water and carrot juice and to eat only a vegetarian diet. And daggone if I didn't get a little bit better. Plus I was in counseling. Mm -hmm. um, but it began to dawn on me a couple of things. One was this odd phenomenon that I, was, that I had been observing in the pharmacy setting because at this point, I'd been a pharmacist for, I'll say, probably six or seven years. And there was this odd thing that I kept observing where a person would come in and get a prescription for, let's say, blood pressure medicine. And the next year, he'd come in with a higher dose of the same blood pressure medicine and maybe a second blood pressure medicine. Then the next year he'd come in with the two blood pressure medicines and a third prescription now for his cholesterol or for diabetes. But this kept happening over and over and over and I began to suspect that maybe this whole signing up for health care maybe wasn't panning out the way that I thought. Like, I thought I was going to make people get better. Hmm. But 
they got diagnosed with hypertension, the hypertension did not go away. They just started taking more drugs for it. And then they ended up with another disease and another drug and another disease and another drug. And that was just sort of well, pluck in something in the back of my head. And then I personally am suffering, literally, with the emotional pain of all of my losses and having these serious physical issues that conventional medicine could not address. And so I began to teach myself. I began to ask, because I was really frustrated. And when you're really irritated and frustrated, you either stew in your own angst or you start figuring out how are you going to change it? Um, I was done stewing. So I started reading everything that I could about homeopathic medicine, nutritional medicine, herbal medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, massage, um, high dose nutrients as medicine, <laughs> meditation, reflexology, aromatherapy, healing touch, therapeutic touch, Reiki, I'm trying to think what else was I studying? All of these things, right? And then I encountered a jeweler who said, gosh, you sound a lot like my crazy friend, Candace. You should go meet my crazy friend, Candace. And crazy Candace, when I walked into her apartment, we'd spoken for maybe 30 seconds and she said, Christy, you got naturopath written all over you. Why don't you go to, and she named a, a college in the Pacific Northwest, get your degree and go change the world. Great. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> About that same time, there was an alternative health magazine that showed up on the stand of some place where I shopped talking about the three schools in North America that were at that time accredited for obtaining a doctorate in naturopathic medicine. Okay, there it is again. And then a third thing serendipitously happened and that was I, was, I was looking for continuing education for pharmacy, and one showed up in the mail on alternative medicine. It was gonna be held in Philadelphia over three weekends, scattered across three different months, and one of the speakers was a naturopathic doctor. <laughs> and when I heard him talk, I knew that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. Yeah. So. And you've grown up. I've grown up. I'm still growing up. Still growing um, up. But 10 years of retail pharmacy, and I came home to my newly betrothed. I just got married again. <laughs> I said yeah. to him, hey, honey, what say we leave everyone we know, sell everything that we have. I'm going to quit my career. And we'll move to the other side of the universe for me to go back to school full time to become a naturopathic doctor. So that's what we did. And I cannot imagine anything better. I love this medicine. Yeah. It is simple yet so incredibly profound. And I have witnessed what conventional medicine would call medical miracles all the time routinely mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and and that whole pharmacy thing that thing that was rattling around in my brain like is this really is this really a thing do the drugs really cause that next disease yeah, yeah. it's real cool i'm i'm looking forward to getting into some of that more you know information stuff. Um, yeah, a few things strike me about your story that are, you know, incredible and yet very ordinary at the same time. And, and that's like one of them being the fact that trauma has a way of kind of opening us up to our authentic self and what our authentic self, 
you know, is being pulled to pursue in this life. Um, and another is like the synchronicity, the amazing synchronicity that, you know, when, when you're open, you know, when we are open, we are so much more aware to the synchronicities that are always present, you know, and we're, we're always being led into one direction or another. And it's, it sounds like you are just open and being led and following along in your path. And wow. Yeah. Amazing. The crazy piece of that was at that point in time, I did not feel the least bit open. Hmm but I did feel physically pulled to the West Coast. Mm. I'm an East Coast girl. Yeah, I don't belong a... out here on the West Coast. I'm here for the moment. Um, but I felt physically pulled out here. Mm -hmm. And now looking back, I see those synchronicities. Mm -hmm. I see the coincidences. Um, and I was, a, I was aware that these three significant things had happened with the magazine and somebody telling me that I should be a naturopath. And, oh, look, there's a naturopath up there on stage talking about alternative medicine. Yeah. Um, sure, I was aware of it at that point, but I had no idea how transformative the educational process would be for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It and was, it sounds, it sounds like it's continuing to transform and evolve yeah. and deepen in yeah. all sorts of ways like we were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. So I'm, I want to dive into, you know, the state of the health of humanity in today's world. And, and from your perspective, like how did we get here to being, you know, I don't know what the statistics are, but it, it seems like, by far the vast majority of the population is on at least one pharmaceutical medication and some, you know, 10 or 12 or 20. Right. So how did so, we get here? Yeah. How did we get here? <laughs> um, like most things, it's a complicated answer. There yeah. are multiple, multiple things that play into our abysmal health statistics. For the developed world, we are among the worst when we look at our health stats. Um, we spend more than twice as much, even compared to the next highest spender in health care. We spend more than twice. And yet, our health statistics rather make us look like an undeveloped not underdeveloped an undeveloped country yeah and yet somehow we're under some misillusion delusion that like we're not or something i don't know it's it's, it's really interesting it's pretty crazy like you yeah. know people talk about the the medical system being just like so state of the art and cutting edge <laughs> and um and i mean i think you know what 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 it is to me is that it's really meeting the demands of society and providing a really immediate fix or band-aid or whatever we want to call it just kind of a a symptom relief sort of approach it's it's yeah it's powerful in that sense i i i absolutely understand what you're saying as far yeah. as the state of the art because that will that is exactly what the brand new hospital claims, what the brand new cancer treatment center under whatever name will say, what the new teaching clinic, how they will brand themselves. We have the latest in, fill in the blank, whatever their specialty is, whatever the niche is. But conventional medical thought has not progressed past say the 1940s, mm -hmm. we declared war on cancer way back then. Medicine, conventional medicine as we know it today is less than 100 years old. We didn't have 
pharmaceutical companies like we know them until between the First and Second World War. Yeah, really yes. more after the Second World War. And so yeah. what comes to mind in the Second World War? Chemicals and chemicals, chemicals, chemicals and chemicals, uh -huh. yeah. chemicals yeah. and death, chemical yeah. warfare that killed off millions of people. Those chemical companies did what after the war? They made drugs. <laughs> Because at that point in time, we actually knew how to mass produce things like penicillin and morphine, which in the trenches is heroic medicine. When you've gotten your leg blown off and you haven't had a bath in three weeks and you're living with the rats in a trench, in the muck, in the mud, yarrow and, Ara and arnica aren't going to cut it. You know, slow medicine isn't what you need in that moment. You need something heroic. You need the morphine to knock that guy out while you're going to cut off a limb that's gangrenous. And you're giving penicillin so that nothing else becomes gangrenous. So those chemical companies like Bayer and Hust Roussel and Sharing Plow, they got their start as chemical companies mm -hmm. and now they turned their focus from making chemicals of mass destruction to pharmaceuticals to be used for heroic intervention about that same time though is when we began to strip out nutrients from foods so when flour, when grains were milled, it used to be that the grain was complete. It was a whole grain and it got crushed into a flour and handed back to the person who brought it to the miller in the first place. But during the wars, especially the Second World War, the women were taken out of the home to go work in the factories to help support the war effort. So people weren't routinely making their own bread. And flour, if you maintain the germ and the bran inside the flour, it will go rancid on the shelf very quickly. But if you take out the bran and the germ, push that off to the side and just give the fluffy stuff back, that can sit on the shelf for a long period of time and then nobody loses money. But what we did lose was 50% of the nutrition once you split it. Mm -hmm. And as it sits on the shelf, we can lose up to 92% of all that was nutritive in that flour. Totally. Yeah. And, and that I, I rarely think about that aspect of, um, you know, nutritional deficiency. I, mm -hmm. I tend to think more about the the soil the the nutrients being depleted from the soil due to you know agricultural practices but but that's a really good point you know and in combination with everything that's happened over the last i don't know it sounds like 60 70 years or so mm -hmm. we've come to a place where yeah we are totally deficient in in so many of these foundational elements that our body uses to stay well and right. um and we you know, and and I also want to get into some of these the fact that like these drugs that were being you know the 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 warfare medicine is uh, is also you know exacerbating a lot of other conditions that you know we're trying to it's like a whack a mole game we're trying to fix <laughs> something but we're causing something due to something else. due to I don't know a number of complicated you know, biochemical st things that are happening in the body. Right. And those biochemical things are direct effects. The very thing that would make a drug effective in one system may cause a problem in a different system. Yeah. I remember in my first, you weren't the teacher, but in the first pharma pharmaceutical pharmacy class that I had, um, the the professor talked about side effects and he he was clear right off the bat these are not side effects these are effects correct that were not the desired side effects correct and because when you put something in the body 
there's going to be a number of effects. There might be one that is favorable for in X scenario. So let's market it as such. And Correct. the other effects are just side effects. Which is, it can be really very problematic mm -hmm. because that mechanism of action, while it may be favorable for the heart, for example, may exacerbate the respiratory system. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, so I'm thinking of beta blockers in that particular scenario. What if it's a, what if it's an indirect effect, meaning the medication produces its therapeutic benefit, but because of its mechanism of action, not directly, but indirectly, it causes glucose dysregulation. Well, now, because you don't have glucose coming into the system appropriately, that can cause something altogether different, like depression or anxiety. What? Yes. And a lot of drugs cause glucose dysregulation, whether that's making the glucose go too high or too low. And then, of course, you look at the standard American diet that has been altered. So that grain that's been stripped out and no longer has any nutri nutritive value added with some meat that is sourced from an animal that is being kept in a way that is just wrong, fed things that are not appropriate fuel for the beast, tormented until death. Um, we're going to now take in not just the meat, but what was residual in, in the meat. So cows are designed to eat grass. But if we put them in pens, because it's more cost effective that way, and we feed them grain instead of grass, then we produce an animal that actually is very high in an inflammatory acid, mm -hmm. arachidonic acid. And that's going to set off an inflammatory cascade, meaning pain in the muscles, pain in the joints, stiffness. We have so much pain in this country. <laughs> These numbers will blow you away. Americans consume 50% of all, roughly 50% of all prescription drugs, 95% of all opioids. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, We're about 5% yeah. of the population of the globe, yet we consume 95% of all the opioids? Yeah. It, it, well, this, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get off on this tangent, but too, too far, but I think it, it's worth saying that, like, I feel oftentimes, like the whole pain epidemic like um, it's just a reflection of society's inability to be with pain, you know. Not not to say that pain is is good, and we need all need to you know br you know brute through it. But but I think that we are so we're so familiar with like being pain free, and when whenever we fall down and scrape a knee like we just pop something to alleviate and numb out so quick rather than allow the natural process of healing, which sometimes involves a little bit of pain. So you're exactly right. I mean, um, this is one of the other contributors to the state that we're in with our poor health statistics. Remember, we, we started this conversation with my story, a little bit of my story and all that emotional pain. Well, chronic pain is the real problem. Hello? There, I'm, I'm flanked by the two cats. So if you see a cat come around my head. Um, and we want quick fixes. We don't want to take responsibility. And that's kind of what we've been told as a pharmacist. <laughs> Really, the ultimate authority is the medical doctor. The medical doctor says, take this drug, your symptoms will go away, 
the pharmacist fills the medication, the patient takes the drug. That's how things work. That's kind of the chain of command with the medical doctor being the general. You had said the battlefield of drugs. You know, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose that battle. The battlefield is the human frame. So even if an antibiotic is given for a bacterial infection, you win the battle against the bug, but you've just destroyed the good bacteria that we are dependent on that normally lives in the gut. That's mm -hmm. the problem. So that's another drug interaction or interference or side effect, if you will. There are yeah. also nutrients that get depleted by the drugs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole industry is really just um, a reflection of reductionistic thinking, you know, right? Because obviously there's more to the body than any one, you know, symptom, but we're just going to really narrow in and hunt down that symptom and fight it till it's death. And it's like, we're more, we're more than that symptom. And, and the long-term consequences can be huge. So what are some of the, I mean, there's too many to list. I don't want you to be like a, a drug commercial listing <laughs> rambling off the side right. effects, but what are some of the, what you see, like when it comes to the common, commonly prescribed medications, what are some of the, <laughs> the, the consequences slash like long-term side effects that you think the world needs to be more aware of? Oh, like what are the scariest drugs that I'm... Well, the, yeah, like the, the scariest drugs that maybe don't seem so scary to the general public because of marketing tactics right. or whatever. So the scariest also in my mind, in my opinion, and I'll tell mm -hmm. you why I have the, hold this opinion. Um, the scariest ones on the market are also the ones that are flooding the market right now because the initial ones have lost their branded patent. So now we have generic equivalents of the biologics. So all the, the entire realm of biologics are the scariest drugs in my professional and experiential opinion. Can you go? Um, can you go in just briefly? Be, can you go in briefly yes. to like what is a biologic and what are they used for? What is a bi biologic? Right, the biologics are the monoclonal antibodies that we are growing on various DNA strands. It might be E. coli DNA. It might be chick embryo DNA. Whatever we are creating these things in the lab from living tissue um, and they are designed to inhibit the cytokines. Cytokines are the, they're the foot soldiers staying with this battlefield kind of um, imagery. The cytokines are the foot soldiers. They're the very first level of a rather complicated immune system that get called in to help. I think the US leads the globe, not only in our spending for what is not healthcare, it's, it's, it's disease management. Um, we also lead in autoimmune conditions. Autoimmune conditions are things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, Graves hyperthyroidism, um, systemic lupus erythematosus, um, Multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, thank you. Scleroderma, Sjogren's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, Crohn's disease. These are all autoimmune conditions. They're very difficult to treat. We've used DMARDs in the past. DMARDs, that just stands for um, disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. Mm -hmm. We've pretty much supplanted them. We've, we've moved them out of the way and we've started using biologics. The rationale is this, the DMARDs make people feel bad. They don't do anything to stop the disease 
process. Some of them can slow the disease process down a little bit, um, but they're designed to mitigate the symptoms, make the symptoms a little bit less problematic. There's a, a whole long conversation we could have about that. Um, the biologics, on the other hand, other than the day of infusion, because almost all of them are IV infusions, or there are a couple of that are, that are subcutaneous injections, and there's one that comes to mind that's an actual pill. Um, these are things like Remicade, Humira, um, Enbrel, Zolaire. Those are the brand names. So why are, why are they so scary? Right. So this makes me all shaky and I, I um, yeah. little disclaimer here. I've been a pharmacist for 30 years. I am not anti-pharmaceutical. There is a time and a place for most every drug that we have on the market. Having said that, this is one of two categories of drugs that freaks me out. And I am not afraid of many drugs. Um, but the biologics, other than the day of infusion, make people feel good. And the advertisements on the television are stellar. They are all about the emotional gotcha. By the way, we're one of only two countries in the world that allows direct-to-consumer marketing, which I think is another yet another problem. Um, but these ads, I'm sure you've seen them. There's Typically, there's a big family gathering and one of the older, like the patriarch of the family is in a wheelchair looking miserable. And, and he's going to be in sepia tones. It's, you know, browns and grays. It looks drab and dreary. He looks drab and dreary. It's all sad. While the rest of the family in vibrant tones, dancing and celebrating, it's, it's a wedding or a graduation or a something celebratory. And there's the patriarch off in the corner by himself. He's miserable in a wheelchair with rheumatoid arthritis. And then the overtones of the commercial and ask your doctor if this drug is right for you. And the next, the next scene is the patriarch out of his wheelchair out of his sepia tone, depressive look and into the vibrance of life, dancing with the grandbaby and picking up the grandbaby and swirling her around and mm. everyone is laughing. <laughs> and if that grandbaby sneezes on him, he may be dead in two weeks because we have taken down his first line of defense. So while these drugs make people feel good enough to re-engage with their lives, and I'm gonna come back to that, we put their lives at risk. And we don't need to do that. I personally have lost friends. I know people who have died after having taken these drugs, and when I talk with their family members, I get the same theme because, of course, when I teach these drugs, it, hands are going up. Well, Dr. Fleetwood, how are these allowed to be on the market if they're killing people? Why, why isn't there a class suit, class action suit against the manufacturer? Be because, students, did you not see the second frame of that advertisement? Did you not see that he was out of the wheelchair? That will happen. That can happen. And the family will not sue because they got that patriarch back. He died quickly, he died suddenly, but that was a better death, a nobler death, a more dignified death than having him suffer in a wheelchair and die five years from now. And I understand that mentality. What makes me so angry is I have taken care of all of those different kinds of people, Graves, Hashimoto's, multiple sclerosis, 
rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, um, not scleroderma. I've never taken care of someone with scleroderma. Hmm. Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, you name it, just about in the autoimmune condition. And I've treated multiple people and I still get them out of their wheelchair. I give them their lives back, or rather I give them the education and the information for them to reclaim their lives. And I have never put anyone at risk. And that's why those drugs make me so angry because we don't have to put our patients at risk in order to create a medical miracle. But it won't happen with the drugs. It can't happen in the drugs because you take the body's inherent healing mechanisms out of the way. You take the person out of his own narrative. What got me healthy, what transformed my life, after all that pain and misery and grief and loss that I went through, was I had a couple of smart people who got me interested in living again. Then I had the hard work of <laughs> engaging in the healing process. But that's where the transformation comes from. It's not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy. It's slow, steady personalized medicine. And that's where naturopathy, naturopathy shines. We, we're med medical miracle makers. That's what we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, the amazing thing I, I love, um, all right, here's, here's my kitty. <laughs> um, <Your> turn. <laughs> my turn with the kitty. Yeah. The amazing thing is the side effects of the naturopathic medicine are more only, life. are only more life <laughs> you know only more of everything good that anyone would ever want right and right. um and yet it's a huge responsibility to consider i i love the way you framed it you know you provide the education and resources for someone to get their life back you don't give them their life back there's no way there's no way you could possibly anyone but but getting the life back, getting the health back on all levels, it's a responsibility that each of us have. And I think we are, you know, back to like something I said earlier, I think we're so used to just surrendering that responsibility to some higher up authority and um, taking, you know, the best that they have to offer, which isn't very good. It's lacking. Yeah. yeah. It's lacking. It's, it's perfect if you need heroic medicine. Mm-hmm. If, if you're bleeding, if you, if you need something to happen right now in this moment, or you will die, then bring on heroic medicine. Yeah. But most of what America is suffering with is a chronic disease process. And here's another thing with the medication. When you give a drug to stop a symptom, you're not taking into account the body's compensation for that drug. Yeah. We aren't designed for the drugs. The drugs have not been around all that long. When we look at other kinds of medicines like botanicals or, hey, food, plants have been around. Animals have been around as long as we have been or longer. So our bodies know what to do with plant matter and know what to do with food substances when it's real. But these pharmaceuticals are chemicals. They may be based off of natural structures, but they are not natural. Yeah, they ultimately uh, stress the system. And way. our system will push back against whatever the drug is. There is a secondary effect. Mm -hmm. And naturopathic medicine takes that into account. We actually use it to our advantage, but conventional medicine does not. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so the, the biologics, I, I, I threw you off course for a few minutes there, right. but I want to hear about the second, um, oh. the second scariest drug class. Right. The second scariest drug class 
the biologics are surging to the top of the most prescribed list of pharmaceuticals. Wow. But the second category have been in the top 10 at least for the last 60 years. And that would be the drugs that we use for mental health, the antidepressants, the anti-anxiety medications, and then the new mood stabilizers that are being utilized for the problems that we've caused by giving so many people antidepressants. Okay, so I'm starting to shake again. <laughs> because again, we, with these drugs, we put people's lives at risk. And, and so then, then the argument ensues, well, if you've got somebody who's suicidal, don't they need to be on the medication? Well, in my opinion, if you're going to put somebody on a medication that can push them deeper into their depression so that if they were suicidal, they may now actually pull the trigger on themselves or on others. And we're seeing a lot more violence against others in larger settings like schools and theaters and nightclubs and parks. And we are more medicated now than we ever have been. If the drugs worked, then why aren't we seeing less mental health? But rather, the drugs are causing more mental health problems. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because we are giving the medicine to people that score high on a PHQ or a GAD which are the patient health questionnaire or the generalized anxiety disorder questionnaire, both of which were written and designed and made popular by pharmaceutical companies who have a vested interest in people taking their drugs. But now the new diagnostic statistics manual has a, a line about bipolar disease that it can be caused by the use of antidepressants. Hmm. So whereas the last manual, the DSM-4 said, you know, there's this not otherwise specified bipolar that might be because of substance. So substance induced bipolar disease and my naive pharmacy brain thought that was illicit substance. Well, the DSM-5 makes it perfectly clear. No, we're not talking about LSD, although that could do it. We're not talking about heroin or cocaine, although that could potentially cause a psychotic break. No, we're talking about the use of antidepressants. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. See, it used to be back in the day that depression, when someone was severely depressed, had major depressive disorder, they weren't walking into the doctor's office asking if this drug was right for them. They had a family member actually picking them up and taking them to a hospital. They were hospitalized before they were given the antidepressants. These days, though, we live such busy, stressed lives, so many of us, that we qualify for major depressive disorder when we are not majorly depressed. And antidepressants, every class of antidepressant, whether it's an SSRI, SNRI, atypical, tricyclic, tetracyclic, it doesn't matter. Every antidepressant has the potential to worsen depression, worsen it to the point of suicide. Every antidepressant, regardless of class, can cause anxiety. And yet, what has conventional medicine decided is the first line of treatment for anxiety? An antidepressant. I don't understand this logic. <laughs> And again, we put our patients' lives at risk because we don't routinely wait 
for family members to bring their severely depressed loved one to a hospital. We have folks walking in saying, I'm not sleeping well, my appetite's all over the place, my sex drive is down, I am so worked up. And the general practitioner, the family medicine doc, the gynecologist, the nurse practitioner in the urgent care says, oh, here's some Prozac. Like it's not a big deal. And these people do not qualify for major depressive disorder. Not when you really look at it closely. Because yeah. stress looks so much like that. Yeah. I mean, what, what we're getting into is obviously a huge topic. And I mean, it, it makes me that feeling that you get in your body, like you're, I don't know yeah. how you would describe it, just like cringe. I cringe yeah. at the... I feel like I'm okay with people numbing out their physical pain with opioids or whatever, but I cringe at the idea of a whole society numbing out any sort of emotional pain. I, I feel like a, a really wonderful, comprehensive solution could be to simply talk with people and connect with people and share our feelings and it's like no one is given any space to even do that in any sort of comfortable way well <laughs> and and there's another facet of why we're in the state that we're in yeah we've gotten so connected with our phones and other devices that the the next expected epidemic is loneliness. Look around the next time you go out. I know you're newly wed, so <laughs> you're, you're gazing into lovely Susanna's eyes, but look around the next time that y'all are out at uh -huh. how many couples are sitting at tables, how many families are sitting at tables and no one is looking at one another. Yeah. Even at a bar. I was at a bar in another country <laughs> with my kid. Right, that sounds really bad. Uh, <laughs> it was his 18th birthday, we were in Ireland, he's studying abroad, and so I flew over to celebrate his 18th birthday, and I was shocked at how many people, even at a bar, like at the bar, we're chatting it up with the bartender, having so much fun, and I'm looking around and everyone else is on a screen. They're not engaged with one another. They're not in, they're not in, in conversation with the person sitting next to them or across the table from them. They're yeah. on their phones. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's an, it's an epidemic. And I think that, um, I think that that loneliness epidemic is, is real. It's really happening. And Yes. I think that um, there's only one solution. It's connecting with ourselves and with one another. And, uh, and I think slowly people are opening their eyes to consider that. Yet I know for a fact there's also like different apps that are being developed to, you know, the, the well-intentioned to kind of, you know, there's a, a lot of great meditation apps but there, it's still like not necessarily getting to the root of the issue. Right. Which is this connection piece. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's a huge topic. The, <laughs> so the, the biologics and the, and the um, kind of antidepressants, anxiolytics, uh, mood altering, mood yeah. stabilizers, mental mood health, mental health. The drugs we use are, for mental yeah. health. Yeah, no, those are huge ones. Um, so I know we're kind of kind of coming to an end. I don't know how you're doing on time, but we can kind of gear ourselves to to land here. But yeah. I want to definitely touch on the point of like you know, given the state of the epidemic proportions of pharmaceutical, you know, prescribing and whatnot, how can, you know, what can people do to get themselves off of medicine? Like, what are some good first steps? 
besides the, the awareness, which is huge. Absolutely. First steps, if you want to reclaim your life, start eating food, real food. Read your labels. Mm -hmm. Read the labels out loud. And I'm not talking the part of the label that has fat grams and salt content and calories. Skip that. Go down underneath that and read the paragraph that starts with ingredients. Yeah, I always, I always say it. Try to avoid reading labels. Try to eat foods that don't don't have labels. That don't have labels, right? But, that's, <laughs> but if but that's if a you're huge step, yeah yeah right? yeah. So if you're going to the grocery store, or you're listening to this podcast and you're standing in front of your cabinet, not your refrigerator where the fresh food is, but the cabinet because it's quick and it's easy. Read the label and read it out loud. Because if you can't wrap your mouth around how to say some of those ingredients, don't put it in your mouth. It's mm -hmm. not real. Yeah. And I mean, so why do we need to eat real food? <laughs> I know it sounds like why? a dumb, why do we silly need question. Food? Yeah. I know. But this, wow, it has escaped the consciousness, it seems, of the American people. We need to eat real food because that is the preferred fuel for our magnificent machines. We're so much better than any machine that has ever been created by mankind, yet it's the best analogy that people can understand. Mm -hmm. So I love to use this particular analogy. I am so much cooler than I look. You, Dr. Alter, know this. <laughs> I ride a motorcycle, people. Right. <laughs> um, and it's a beautiful British bike that requires high octane unleaded fuel. Well, back in the day, I used to have this weed eater that we used cheap leaded regular fuel and cheap oil. And we blended the two together into one container and you shook it up good and labeled it for the weed eater only. Now, what if I decide to take a trip and my budget's a little bit tight what if I put the weed eater, the perfect fuel for the weed eater into my beautiful British bike? What's that going to do to my magnificent motorcycle? Only you would know. Bad things. Bad things. Yeah. I'm not going to look cool jumping down the interstate with black <laughs> smoke coming out of the pipe. Yeah. I'm not going to be Good. Yet we think as human beings that we can ingest stripped out flour, grain fed beef, tortured chickens, and we're going to be okay. Yeah, and well, th that's that's like not even close to the worst of it, right? There's, I mean, what about the chemical, like the chemical warfare that right. goes into our food? Right. We've <laughs> got genetically modified organisms. We've yeah. got so again, read read your labels. You'll yeah. see. I mean, even even on some of the supplements, you read the inert ingredients, the other ingredients, and it blows my mind. Why do we need sucralose and aspartame and Asosulfame K on a multivitamin. Yeah. Why? Those are no neurotoxins. What? You know, if I were a conspiracy theorist, I would begin to wonder if this were being done to the American pop populace on purpose because it's just ludicrous some of the chemicals that you find in prescription drugs supplements that we think are supposed to be beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. And when major companies like General Mills comes out and says, you know what, American people, we're going to start offering you non-genetically modified Cheerios. Thank you. How long have you been feeding us the other stuff without our knowledge? Yeah not okay with that so so what else besides so, food all of these things read your labels yeah. eat real food the second thing is drink clean water that prozac we mentioned earlier 
actually has an active metabolite with a half-life of six weeks. And there's no way to filter that out of the water. That means that whoever is taking Prozac and more and more people in America are taking Prozac because everybody's writing for it because they think it's a benign drug, that's going to be actively excreted in the urine, in the feces. And it goes into the water that will then be processed that's given back to us to, to drink. And there's no way to take drug metabolites out of our water filtration systems. Mm -hmm. They're not designed for that. Mm -hmm. So as best you can, filter your water after it's come through the other fil filters into your home. Whether you use a reverse mm -hmm. osmosis process or some of the fancier splitting of the water, there are these 10 multi-step systems that have carbon blocks and micron, small micron filters and all kinds of different layers of filtration materials that water can be put through or find an artesian well and fill right. up your bottles at the artesian well. Water is important. Water is hugely important. Food, real food is hugely important. Sleep. Sleep is hugely important. If you aren't sleeping well, then your body cannot heal itself. We can only repair during parasympathetic nervous system dominance, which happens during sleep. Also happens when we eat, if <laughs> we're just eating when we're eating, not driving, texting, walking, running. <laughs> texting. I think right. you said that. Um, healthy relationships, healthy thoughts. I have teenage boys and um, I was an older mom when I had these boys. I was 35 and 37 when I had my kids. And therefore we, we like different genres of music. Go figure. Like that didn't happen with me and my parents. Um, but the guys will come in singing something that's a catchy phrase on the popular radio shows. And I will stop them and say, hey, babe, you know what you're singing? Things come into us, is my point. Um, whether you are consciously aware of it or not, everything that you hear comes in, everything that you see comes in, what you're reading in in the books that you get from the library, what you're seeing on the television, what you're hearing through the radio. These are what the billboards are saying. These are things that come into our psyches, whether we are consciously aware or not. And I am convinced when we have a generation listening to music that is violent and watching television shows or movies that are violent and playing video games that are violent, then they've got violence all over, all inside them, and they are more likely to be violent. Call me crazy, but it seems to be playing out. And even our pop culture, which somebody I think very wisely said, if you want to know what the culture is like, look at their pop culture and find the metaphor. Right now, it's all about zombies. I, I haven't does even thought not, of that. Does that know. not kind of sum up everything? Yeah. Where there's a disconnect. We're so connected, right, that nobody can have a conversation. There's no real communication. You're on your own. People are out to get you. There's a lot of violence. It's not, it's all this surreal kind of sensation. Yeah. That's Gosh, a that's point. a downer. We, we, we can't leave the conversation <laughs> here. All right. So what else needs to happen? Healthy thoughts, healthy relationships, real 
real connection mm -hmm. with people that matter. And I would dare say work that also has you deeply connected in something that matters. So if politics is what really gets you going, get involved in politics. If education is your thing, then get involved and teach. If you're irritated with the status quo and the socioeconomic issue, then do what you can do to make that change. Mm -hmm. For me, I took a test when I was 17 that said I was uniquely positioned to be well-suited for the healing arts. It <laughs> took me a little while, but I found it. Find your purpose and live right into it. Love it and not to be understated in any matter of ways. Yeah, it's like central. Purpose is central. Yeah. And it's like when, I like to think that when we are engaging in the purpose, with the purpose, then everything else, like why would you put chemicals in your mouth when you're engaging in your purpose? You know, it's like, right. We want to be in tip top shape in all, in all ways when we're like, you know, on, in the flow in that sort of way. True. Yeah. I love it. I, I usually, I think we, we forgot at some point to, to state outright that the body heals itself. I think we've, we implied it throughout our conversation here towards the end that the body is always healing itself and simply creating an environment inside and outside that allows what the body naturally does all the time. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, it's healing <laughs> arts. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, it's a good grasp of normal, functional physiology. Mm -hmm. How are we designed to function? Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. We, we got into some good stuff and I'm so glad that we had an opportunity to hear your, your story, which is, um, you know, such an impactful one. So thanks for sharing that. And how can people connect with you if they could to learn more about what you're doing or well, <laughs> I don't know. All that cool stuff. All that cool um, stuff. I am doing some cool stuff right yeah. now too. So I have, I have two websites. They're, they're, it's the same content, just two different names. Um, the quick and easy way to find Dr. Christy Fleetwood is ask the Google, Christy Fleetwood. My only competition happens to be Christine McVie of Fleetwood Mac. I'm okay with that kind of competition. Um, so it's Christy Fleetwood, ndrph.com my name, my credentials, naturopathic doctor, registered pharmacist. Um, my business name is Monarch Natural Medicine. So that's the second website, monarchnaturalmedicine.net. Just think of Monarch Butterfly and chasing those butterflies when you were a kid with a net. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's been a lot of fun and uh, thanks for your time and your wisdom Absolutely. and your sharing with us. Thank you. All right. Peace and love. <laughs>